good afternoon, dear colleagues. We are about to start the next talk in Halmstad Colloquium series. Uh, I remind that the objective of the Halmstad Colloquium is to bring distinguished speakers to talk about the topics related to embedded systems and control here to Halmstad University and I'm happy today to introduce Doug Leith. Uh, Doug Leith got his PhD from uh, the University of Glasgow in uh, 1989 and since 2001, he has been a director and actually a establisher of a Hamilton Institute, which is a multidisciplinary research institute within the National University of Ireland at Maynooth. Uh, Doug's research interests are quite broad. His current research interests are mostly about the congestion control in networks and distributed resource allocation in wireless networks. The institute itself, now it has been for a little bit more than 10 years already in the full operational mode and uh, is quite a noticeable multidisciplinary center. Uh, so I don't say anything more to save time for, for the speaker. Uh, Doug, you're welcome here and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, Alexi. And thank, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. It's been a real, real pleasure the last uh, day and, and, and uh, I'm here until tomorrow. Uh, it's, been, so it's been very enjoyable talking, talking to you and I see the sun has been shining as well, although it's, I see that's just changed. So. Um, we're not so many, so maybe that I'd encourage you to, if you have questions, to interrupt in the middle and we just have a, we can have a conversation rather than being so one way. And the, what, what I th there's a range of different things I could have talked about, so, what, but, so this is just one of the, the areas that uh, I've been involved in, and together with colleagues at the Hamilton, uh, to give a little taste of it. The, and so it's, it's got a, a bit of history around it. So well, I guess I'll, I'll start by saying... Um, what, uh, how, how we got there. What was, I'll, I'll get to the point when I explain what I mean by decentralised constraint satisfaction. Um, but there's a bit of history where um, coming, so, so in, in what I like to do in, and other people in Hampton is to combine um, um, nice mathematics with real, real problems. And so to um, take, look at, look at uh, do experimental work. <laughs> Do, do experimental work. Uh, from that, we see th that there's uh, p problems that, that motivates nice mathematical questions, find solutions, and go back and answer that. And one of the first problems that, that uh, we were looking at in wireless networks was interference management, which is one of the fundamental problems in wireless networks as opposed to wired networks, of course. And uh, the you, so I'm jumping ahead a little bit, so I'll, I'll, I'll revisit some, some things I'm going to say now. But the, the motivation was that of why looking at real problems led to different questions was actually usually couched as a graph coloring problem with the presumption that you know the graph and you can use centralised methods. But that's not. But when you go and look at real problems, they're nothing like that. Very, very often not like that anyway. An example would be if I have a Wi-Fi uh, a wireless LAN in my house, typically on the end of the DSL uh, modem, and my neighbour has a Wi-Fi modem in his house and the people upstairs, if I'm in an apartment block, have theirs. I've got multiple interfering uh, uh, wireless networks and none of them can talk to each other because I've got, uh, gone out of my way to put a lot of security around them so they will, will not talk to each other and I'd be disappointed if they did. So they can't coordinate. They're not even aware of each other's existence necessarily because they may not be able to hear each other properly. So there's no way I can know the graph. They can't talk to each other. How can I do interference management in a realistic setting like that? I would, what I would like is for interfering uh, wireless LANs to choose uh, separate channels so they don't uh, tread on each other when they make transmissions. How, can you, how could you solve a problem like that? That's quite different from the way uh, interference management is usually cast as that question. That came directly out of us uh, looking at practical, um, practical problems. And so that leads to a nice mathematical question, which was the starting point for the work here. A nice back into solutions, and I'll show you some measurements at the end as well. So, so starting from that, that, that was the kind of history from here. So since then it's grown and we've seen that actually a whole collection of apparently unrelated 
uh, problems. The ones here I'm going to talk about are related to networking, uh, wireless networks, but, but actually also in other areas. Um, apparently, we can all be put in this same framework, or this constraint satisfaction framework, which is very general in the end, much more general than, than inference management and graph colouring. Uh, so constraint satisfaction is a much more uh, general framework for thinking about things, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Decentralization is, so here I'm using decentralization, so distributed and decentralized are used, often used interchangeably. Here I'm using it for um, very, very strong information constraints where I can have no message passing at all between uh, 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 the pro computers that are trying to coordinate their action. So no message passing at all. So distributed in a very strong sense. And an example would be interference management in wireless LANs in, in an apartment block where things are you want to coordinate them, but you cannot uh, communicate. But there's lots of other examples like that. And actually, even if you can message pass often, you'd prefer not to because you get instant scalability if you don't pass messages. That's the usual constraint on parallelization of things, is, is the cost of communication. If you don't have to communicate, things scale tr tremendously well. Uh, and so, so I'll talk a bit about constraint satisfaction, talk a bit about decentralization, and then give, we'll give some analysis and uh, performance results. Of, of a particular class of algorithms that are kind of interesting. So decentralization is the key in red. So I've already, so I, um, here's just something we were talking about, about uh, at lunch, I think actually the, the, the uh, graph coloring kind of problems appear all over the place and they're just a special case of constraint satisfaction. It's a much bigger class of problems than graph coloring. Um, so an example would be, a typical idea would be uh, we have a choice between, in a wireless network, between a centralized TDMA scheduler where we divide time up into slots, we allocate a slot to each transmitter and they take turns, and there's some central coordinating body that allocates that. Or like timetables in a, in a room, right? we've allocated this room here and only one person is talking here at a time. The um, alternative might is the random access CSMA style of of scheduling that's used in uh, H2.11 and, uh, and, and r related networks, where uh, instead we do some, so there, there's no central coordinator, but instead the stations do some random access and, and uh, schedule the transmissions separately, but in a, in a way that, so in that case you get uh, collisions and maybe lower performance. That's, that's the, the normal thinking. But, but is it really, so is it really, that those really the two extremes? Is, can, can you not combine it? Can you not have the question would be can, that you can try and answer is, couldn't we um, get the transmitters without talking to each other to coordinate which, which slots they transmit in so that they, they don't collide? So we have some memory in the system, some lear learning in the system. But here, so here we want each transmitter, uh, we've got a set of transmitters in a wireless LAN. Each of them can uh, measure whether other transmitters, if I make a, trans a, a transmission and another station makes a transmission, I get a collision. I can detect that because my transmission will fail. Or I can detect, um, so that's number two there. Or number one, or I can detect that I've made a transmission and it succeeded. And that's the only information I have. I make transmissions, did it succeed or did it fail? If it succeeds, I know I was the only one using the slot. Everyone else was using another slot. Uh, or I uh, failed, in which case one or more of the other transmitters in the, the work network were using the, the same slot as me, so that was a collision. So given that information only, which is really limited information, can they agree on, a, a, on, a, on different slots to, to, to all transmit in different slots? And so that's a graph coloring problem. So th uh, if I, each transmitter is, a, uh, is one of these circles here, these vertices, and I put an edge between uh, two transmitters if they or could collide. And here, because it's a wireless LAN, if any two transmit, I get a collision, there's an edge between all pairs, so that's a complete graph. And what I would like is, if I call a slot a colour, I would like them all to choose different colours. And here I have a problem because two of them have chosen blue, so I've got a red line there telling me that uh, that was a collision. I'd really like one of those, th those two to choose different colours. Uh, so that would correspond to them. If I could colour that graph using only that information, so with no, no explicit communication, but just some sensing, then, uh, then I would have a collision-free schedule and without any centralised controller. So can we do that? Another, another example that's kind of similar um, with a different orthogonal resource instead of time, it's frequency, is what the one I mentioned at the start, which was the original motivation for channel selection. So in uh, the 2.4 gigahertz band, which is the one that a lot of the Wi-Fi uses, there's only three over non-overlapping channels. 
Um, typically, the interference range is bigger than the communication range, so we have uh, all the security, meaning we can't talk over the wired network, plus uh, we can't necessarily decode transmissions from neighbouring stations. They may be creating power on the air, have energy on the air that disrupts our transmissions, but they, we are unable to decode them because, it's, uh, then, uh, because of the modulation coding scheme used. So we can't actually listen to the air, what's happening in the air either. So they can interact with each other, but they, uh, they can't talk, they can't communicate. And the, the information that's available is that um, I can try a channel, I can try uh, choose a channel, make some transmissions. If it's all working well, I, d I don't see any uh, losses and things are good, then I know that none of my neighbours are using that channel and that was good. So I could detect that information. But if I uh, try a channel and I'm seeing a, a, a lots of hidden terminal effects and, 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 and packet losses and it's a terrible channel, then I know that at least one other has selected this, this same channel. There might be more than one, we don't know the number, we just know someone else is on that channel. So it's a bit like the uh, collision slot set up. So you can, uh, as I've described it here, it can kind of be thought of as graph colouring, but it's def the actual problem is definitely not graph colouring, and I'll show some results later about why it's not. Um, but so again, here, here we don't have a complete graph now because the, the topology might be different. So there's not an edge between all the... Each, each uh, vertex here is a wireless LAN. There's edges between ones which uh, uh, interfere. The, um, there's not all not complete because it depends on the spatial layout. And again, here we've got three uh, which have chosen the same channel, and so they've got they're, they're uh, got a conflict, whereas the other guys are conflict free, so they're on orthogonal channels. And we'd like to find an allocation of channels which was completely conflict free, and with only that information, no message passing, just sensing. So that's a really crude, that's a caricature of, chan of the channel allocation problem. Uh, again, from, if you go take some measurements, then, uh, then it's much, much more complicated than that. And it's sort of no surprise, actually, once you start to think about it. So one is that um, there's lots of, in the, in the unlicensed band where you stood to live in, uh, is operating, there's lots of other transmitters. There's microwave ovens and Bluetooth and phones and, and uh, all, all sorts of other things uh, transmitting in the same band as you. So there's non-network sources of noise. So these are measurements inside the uh, Hamilton from a while back. And what this was dot eleven a actually. They, they, uh, they, t we took a pair of stations, a pair of, of uh, stations, sent some traffic through it and measured the throughput, and then just changed channels, hopped channels. And you see that there's a big hole in the middle here where the throughput is zero. And that was because of some Bluetooth. So we looked at spectrum analyzer. You can see exactly in that hole there was a bunch of transmissions from Bluetooth. So there's non-network sources of noise. It's just not, it's not all going to be dot eleven, and we could accommodate that inside the, frame, the other framework by having a, an extra ver by having extra vertices which aren't dot eleven, so that's still inside the framework. Uh, this is more challenging. Here, um, the interference is channel dependent. So again, this is taking a pair of vertices and, and um, taking two sets of links and jumping both of them together across channels, two interfering links, and measuring the, uh, the loss rate. And so what you find is that, um, so the loss rate is, as we hop channels here, at the edges the loss rate was low, so they weren't interfering, but in the middle they do interfere. So the, whether they interfere or not, whether we have an edge in this graph depends on what channels the vertices of, or colours the vertices have chosen. So it's not a graph colouring problem at all. Um, instead it looks, we have uh, edges that depend on who's transmitting. So we could have something like this. If those three guys have chosen blue, we might have a conflict. They're on the, on, on the channel, blue channel, they might be conflicting. But if we change to a brown channel, there's no conflict. There's only, well, one of the conflicts is gone. So the choice of colors affects the graph. So that's not a, a traditional graph problem, problem at all. Again, though, uh, we know that uh, our information is we know whether the channel was good or bad for us. So those were all kind of orthogonal resources. There's another, but the, the framework's much more, the, the constraint satisfaction was much more general than that. So here was an example of something completely different to do with uh, network coding. So um, here, which I'll show, can be also set in the same framework. So uh, what we have here is, a, this is a, I don't know if you, um, how much you guys know about network coding, but it's, it's straightforward enough. So we have a transmitter, two transmitters, that's sigma one and sigma two are two transmitters. Sigma 1 is trying to send data to delta 1 here, that's its destination. Sigma 2 is trying to send data up to delta 2 there. And they cross in the middle. 
And these edges, these are, these are broadcast edges, so this is wireless. So this guy, when he transmits, is received by both of those. When the guy up there transmits, it's received by those two. And when he transmits in the middle, it's received by both of those guys. So there's a, these broadcast uh, regions. And so if we... Um, and, so, and each of those links has a unit capacity. Let's say we can transmit one packet per second. So the capacity, if they're crossing. So if we just do straight standard tra packet transmissions, they, they each from uh, sigma 1 to delta 1, we can get rate a half. And from sigma 2 to delta 2, we could get rate a half. Because then this, this is the bottleneck link here. And we just partition it and give half the time to one, half the time to the other. And they cross in the middle. And that, so if we just do standard transmissions, that's the capacity of it. But actually, you can do much better than that by using coding. And so this, is, well, this was the uh, archetypal example used by network coding people. So that's what these, this information here is. That's the, inf that's the coding scheme used. So, uh, so what we're doing is we're going to XOR together packets from uh, the two different sources. So that's source one and source two. So coming down here, we don't, the only packets we have at this point are from source two. So we have no choice there. We're constrained. So here we take source two and packets and transmit them down both of those, those uh, links. Same with source one, we transmit source one packets. But in the middle we have a choice because we have both source one and source two packets. And the, the optimal choice is actually to code them both together, to XOR them together. And then what happens is we've received here, we've received packet two the, from source two here. We've received uh, source one plus source two here. And we can just subtract off source two and get source one that way. And that way we're getting rate one to both of these. So we've doubled our throughput by using the coding. So that so, so far so good. The, so that's a nothing, nothing new there. The, que the question is how do we, on a general topology, how do we choose these allocations of codes? They, we have a, we have, they have to be feasible. We better have the, code, the packets at the be in beginning <coughs> here that we need in order to code together. And we also, so they have to be feasible in that sense at every single stage. And we also want to decode pa the packets from the source that, that, we wa that we're wanting to arrive at this destination. So we've got an end constraint as well. So we've got a bunch of really strong integer constraints on what to do. Can we, in general topologies, uh, select the, the codes? And that's an NP-hard problem. Uh, the, so each link can determine whether its own coding is realizable. So if the packet's arriving, it has all the packets arriving that it needs to code together, it can decide that with information it has. And, and each link can tell, uh, or if it doesn't, so that's the information each link knows now. It's uh, links are the, the objects here including this guy at the end here, he knows if he's uh, getting the final result. So we have, we, but that's the only information, we're not talking to each other, can we do that? In a, in, so it's a similar setup where each link here now knows if it's happy or unhappy, but they're not really talking to each other beyond that, they're not coordinating beyond that. And it turns out that's the same, very similar, it fits inside the same framework and is nothing like uh, the other scheduling problems. So, so what is that framework? So. Uh, so here's, here's what I'm meaning by constraint satisfaction problem. This is a totally standard definition, it's not mine. So what, what a constraint satisfaction problem in, in general is, is that we have uh, n variables. Each variable takes values on a finite domain of size d. It could be anything you like, colors, uh, codes, whatever. We have m clauses. And what a clause is just a mapping which takes this, the n variables and returns a 0 or a 1, happy or unhappy. And a clause, so a clause is satisfied if it returns one and zero otherwise it's unsatisfied. And what we're looking for is a choice of the variables. We can choose the, uh, we've got this set of n variables. We can assign values one to, uh, to d to them. A, cho a set of any, any choice of any allocation, assignment of value to, to at x that makes uh, all, these five, all these clauses happy. So that means the minimum over all the clauses is one. It's another way of writing it. So they're all happy, and that's why it's constraint satisfaction. And we don't rank them, any one is good enough. So in a colouring of a graph, any colouring is good enough. In the coding case, any, any feasible coding is, is equally good. There's no ranking, it's not an optimization problem. So oh, that's just another way of saying that they all the clauses have to be equal to one. They can only, each clause can only have a value of zero or one. Okay, so so if any one was zero, then the minimum would be zero here. That's right. That's then, then you have a solution. And if that's not true, if anyone is unsatisfied, you don't have a solution. 
And so, going back to those examples, um, if we have the scheduling example where it was a complete graph, the vertices are the, the nodes, the edges are between, uh, there's an edge between every one of them. We have n choose two clauses, one for each pair of, of uh, transmitting stations. And we have uh, the clause returns one if they've chosen different colours, and zero otherwise. So we're happy if every pair of stations has chosen a different colour, and unhappy otherwise. Right. Straightforward. The channel allocation, in that case, we've got a smaller number of clauses because we don't have a complete graph. We could have just a general graph. Uh, but it's very similar. Again, each pair, if they're neighbours in this, this graph, then we want them to, uh, and they have the same colour, then we're unhappy. But if they have different colours, we're happy. And we're satisfied if we find any allocation of colours so that everyone has a disjoint. Uh, all neighbours have different colours. And you can put that coding problem in the same framework. And, and lots of others, it's very general. Uh, so there's... Um, so that, that's, a, that's, that's constraint satisfaction classical. That's not, not my setup, that would be a standard computer science setup. And there's a whole bunch of... Uh, a whole industry around trying to find solvers for these kind of problems. Uh, KSAT is one of an archetypal MP-hard problem. Uh, there's competitions every year for, for people trying to uh, solve problems with millions of variables and millions of clauses as fast as possible. So the, the difference here is we're interested particularly with these strong information constraints so that we, we're not taking a centralised approach, we're wanting this decentralised approach where all we have is this very limited information. So each variable only knows whether it's a happy or unhappy. I think I'm jumping ahead in my slides. So let me, yeah, let me define this, let me write this slightly differently. So I have to define this set MI. So MI is the set of clauses in which a variable participates. In a graph, it would be the set of pairs of neighbours that, that it interacts with. So let, remember, MI is the set of clauses that a variable is, invo M, what I is involved in. And so what we want, that's the only information that's available to, if you remember from the graph colouring one, we only know we don't know the values of each of the individual clauses. We don't know pairwise the solution, the answers. Am I clashing with this neighbour or that neighbour? All I know is, am I cl clashing with some neighbour or not? And that's what this is saying. I only know the minimum over all the clauses I participate in. Either I'm clashing with someone or I'm not clashing. That's all. It's very, very limited information. And that's formalising that. And I'll relax that still further later, actually. Um, and so what do we mean by a solver? It means we we're going to find a satisfying ass ass assignment eventually and also the second condition there is that uh, when the first time we find an assignment we want, to, we want to stick, we want to stop there, we don't want to move away from it and all the information we have each variable only knows if all its clauses it participates in are happy or all are unhappy um, and it, or one or more are unhappy and you can only, each variable is very decentralised so only uh, you can only update a variable xi without knowing any of the other variables. You know your own value, of course, but you don't know any of the others. You don't even know the number of, of the others, because it's, think of the wireless setup. We don't know the number of interfering uh, uh, other variables. We certainly don't know the values. We don't know the number of them. We don't know the clauses. We don't know the set that, that we're participating in. Um, and we don't know the clauses either. We don't know the topology or the physical layout. We don't know any of this stuff. All we know is, are we happy or unhappy? So really, really limited information, and none of the existing algorithms satisfy that. So the state of the art would be variations on DPLL, and I'll, I'll show an example of that later. Uh, basically, that's a tree search, a backtracking tree search. We, we tried different options. If it's infeasible, we backtrack and try down. So it's brute force tree search with some optimization. It's super fast, uh, but completely centralized. Um, there's, there's various other ones uh, which all involve violating. They all essentially involve, they're all centralized in nature. So here's so that sounds like a, a, a sounds like a, um, a at least when we start anyway it sounds like a tall order that you could you ever could you even solve these problems these are MP hard problems they're very hard problems we have no very, almost no information can, can can you actually solve these and it turns out you can and here's a constructive way of showing that you can here's that present an algorithm and then we'll show some results to show that some analysis of it to show that it will find solutions and then kind of generalize from that and I'll give some examples. So, so the, the algorithm is so simple, I can just write it up. So first of all, so what each variable keeps a vector of probabilities. 
which is the for a probability for each of the possible value, uh, values of its variable from 0 to d. And initially, you can initialize it to anything you like, so you could just make it 1 up in d uniform for all the... because you don't know any better. Uh, then we toss a coin, so we're going to repeat this forever. We toss a coin, um, and we choose a colour with probability according to that, that probability distribution in the p's. So we choose a colour j with probability pij. Then we try it, so we do some transmissions on that channel, or we transmit in that slot, or we try that code, uh, or, or whatever our, our particular problem is. So we evaluate this minimum over all the clauses we participate in, and get the answer 0 or 1. Are we happy or unhappy? That's all the information we have. If we're happy, then we stick. That was good. So what we do is make the probability of choosing that closer again 1 and all the others 0. If we're unhappy, then we... Uh, th so there's different ways we could do this. We reallocate... We, we can reduce the probability of choosing that color again and reallocate that probability across the other colors, the other choices of variable, and repeat. So, so there's a couple of design parameters in here. And repeat forever. Now, there's uh, some things that are clear. If everyone is satisfied, then we stop, because everyone's here. They, they, you find a colour that's happy. If everyone finds a colour that's happy, we just stopped. So we've got automatic stopping. We've also got, without any coordination, and we've also got automatic restarting. If, if for example, you add a new vertex to your problem, a new, new transmitter, and suddenly someone's unhappy, then they, they kick into here, and automatically the, 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 the thing restarts. So starting and stopping, which is one of the big problems um, you, you don't want to do that with communication. Coordinated starting and stopping is a hard thing to do without with, uh, out communication is, is sorted here. And, and it's very, very simple. And so here's, here's the, uh, the, the a main result that if, if the problem you're asking has an answer, then with probability one, that algorithm will find the answer. So it's, with that very limited information, it turns out you can actually solve these things. And uh, better than that, we can actually give a bound on the rate. So, so we think it's a loose bound, but you can get a bound on the rate. So it's e to the n squared, roughly, which is pretty slow. We think it should be at least e to the n, because uh, it's NP-hard. But e to the n squared is a bit worse than that. But if it's graph colouring, in the special case... So that's the general constraint satisfaction separate. In the special case of graph colouring, which is extra structure, this bound can be sharpened to be e to the n. So that's order optimal, actually. You won't be e to the n, because these are NP-hard problems. So let me show you an example. Now, you can't quite see the bottom of the bottom there because the resolution isn't good here. So let me uh, pick uh, an example. So here's, so that was really fast. So this is a, just picked a graph. So the bottom here that you can't see, this is the number of unsatisfied vertices. And as I, so this is a graph of 200 vertices, six colors. It's quite a hard choice to color, actually. Um, but I have too many colors, so it's finding them very quickly. If I reduce the number of colors, um, it gets harder. See, so it takes longer and longer, but it does. It's taken a, a bit longer. I probably will get to the point where it won't converge. Now, that's now four. Once I choose too, f too few colors so there's no solution, then of course it can't find a solution. But it's, got, it's still got interesting behavior, actually, even if there is no solution. I'm guessing there's no solution in this case. Uh, because most of the graph's happy most of the time, actually. It's only a small number are unhappy. So maybe that's not... actually has found a solution. So, so uh, but you notice that it was nice in the, in, the, in the period of while it was converging, nearly all, so if these were wireless networks, pretty much everyone's happy. It's only a small number. It very quick, so that's a characteristic that you see when you run these simulations a lot, that uh, very quickly the bulk of the network gets fixed. And then typically you have these boundaries where the, there's, there's a couple of vertices unhappy and they kind of jumble around and, and eventually sort themselves out. So, so during the intermediate phase, while it's converging, it's actually got quite nice behavior, and it's pretty fast. Of course, let, let me show you DPLL on the same problem. It'll be much faster. <laughs> uh, pretty fast. So that's the state of the art. You won't, won't really beat that. And you, uh, unfortunately, the resolution is you can't see off the bottom there, but you get some sense that... Um, we could try it again. 
it's pretty fast. So we could try, so we can keep, so if you look at examples like that, and there's not, this applet's on the web, so you can go play around with it, you get some sense of how it's converging. And there's, um, there's two, two observations to make from that, other than that it's quite good fun to play around with. What, one is um, the method, so the me I haven't talked about the method of proof, but the method of proof is brute force, and it, it, the way you, you find a, uh, it, it finds a sample path, it's a random algorithm with, which has a non-zero probability, You've bounded the probability away from zero, and then you, you, you show uh, if you repeat, it, repeat the iterations that, that eventually that's going to occur with some probability. Um, and the sample path is where you have a flame front moving through the, the graph, where one, the one uh, clump gets coloured correctly, and then they start colouring their neighbours, and it moves through. And you can see that, that the actual colouring doesn't look anything like that. And so that's why I think that e to the n squared, I'm hoping that e to the n squared bound is uh, way, way too loose. Uh, and we're trying to get something uh, tighter, but it's hard to do it in general, so maybe in special cases you can get something better. The other thing is, in all these graphs, so these are type geometric type graphs, uh, it's, uh, it's fast, it's, it's consistently fast, and I'll show you some measurements later to, to back that up, but there's some bad examples. Let me show you uh, a really bad example. There's some things it's not good for. So here's a star graph. This is a bipartite graph. So... Um, we have, so it's, called, it's two colourable. If we choose the middle guy to be red and the outer guy to be blue, that's the solution, right? It's a really simple solution. And if you know it's a bipartite graph, it can be coloured in polynomial time. Uh, and DPLL will do it immediately. So let's try DPLL. Right, one step, as you'd expect. Now watch what happens um, with the random algorithm, right? So what it's needing is, it's good and it'll go on for a long, long, long time. So this is something close to a worst case. Um, so what it needs is for all of these guys on the outside to simultaneously, that's with four colours as well, and it's still taking ages. Um, if you, it, it should be able to do it with two colours. Um, it's needing all, whenever any of these guys clashes with the middle guy, he's unhappy. And so to get to the point when they're all, just all of the outside guys, and there's 50 of those, have chosen a different colour from the centre guy, is just incredibly unlikely. It takes you ages and ages and ages for that event to happen. And it will converge, if I leave this long enough. It will for sure converge, but, uh, but it can take a really, really long time. So, so here's a bad problem, and another sort of problem that's really bad is consensus problems. Getting guys, the opposite problem, instead of trying to get, choose disjoint colours, choosing, getting uh, the verses to all choose the same colour, the algorithm is also really bad for. So, the, uh, so certainly um, there's cases where it performs quite badly uh, for reasons that are clear enough, but the, on those other sorts of graphs, which geometric kind of graphs, which are what, happen, what you see all the time uh, for, for physical reasons in, uh, in wireless networks, then, then it performs brilliantly. It's really, really good. So let me jump on. So and I'll show you some more summary data to try and back up what I'm saying about it being fast in, in, in a lot of cases. But definitely there's cases where it's slow, so don't <coughs> use it there. But it's, it's still even surprising that you can solve these problems at all. These are hard problems with, with so little information. Um, the, so here, there's some obvious generalizations. Uh, this, this one's an obvious one, actually. The next one's less obvious. Uh, there was these A's and B's parameters, uh, which were global. You could make them depend on the I. So the idea is, for example, that if you you're have a dense area of the graph with many neighbours, you might want to use different parameters from a sparse area of the graph. And by doing that, you could, by locally adapting them, you could speed up convergence, and for sure you can do that. Uh, the convergence, the, those pre theorems apply in this case about convergence, but the rate seems to empirically to be much faster. And here's a more, here, this one is another generalisation which is uh, less obvious, actually, and is interesting because it's easier to implement. Um, and so the idea is here, if we're, everything's the same except we're unhappy. If we've, been, if we've been happy and then we become unhappy, then we stick uh, for n tries. So once we've been happy, we'll give it n more goes and the same colour, the same choice of variable before we give up. And then we choose uniformly at random. So this n is our design parameter and it somehow gives an idea of the stickiness, how, how reluctant, what well, after success, how reluctant uh, a variable is to give up. And so long as that, so, that, so there's only one parameter here, and the performance of this is virtually identical when you try it in, in, in lots of simulations. The, the rate of convergence is very, very similar to that uh, more gen other algorithm that, that I put first of all. And the interesting thing about this one is it's um, 
it's much simpler, so it's easier to analyze. We can actually get, so if we, for example, but the ease, the simple, because it's simpler to analyze, if we have, you can just get results like, if we have uh, enough colors, if the D there is big enough, then, uh, then this will converge uh, in polynomial time. It will converge uh, logarithmically, in fact, lo in log n. The, um, so so it will be very fast if you have enough colours, which is very hard to show that's that kind of behaviour that you'd expect for that other algorithm, because this one, and that's the benefit of this one being simpler. And the original reason, actually, for coming up with this is it's much simpler to implement in hardware, because we were looking at implementing this, the, the wireless scheduling, the, the collision-free TDMA uh, scheduling in, on real hardware, and there it's, it's, you're very constrained by what's possible in hardware, and the, the uh, other approach actually we c was uh, hard to implement given the, the processing constraints and the timing constraints. Whereas this is so much easier, we could actually implement this. So the simplicity gives two gains. It's uh, simpler to implement and easier to analyze. So, and the fact that it has the same... So there's, there's a class of algorithms that, have, that, that have, um, no, don't need much communication at all, or no, no communication here other than through sensing, and which uh, are, will all converge. So that's sort of interesting. It's not just the one algorithm. And we can also... This is much more recent stuff. You can relax the sensing. So we have this. We have assumed that everyone involved in a clause can detect whether the clause is uh, they're happy or not. So if I have uh, some, some wireless uh, stations interfering, um, if anyone is interfering with anyone else, you can, de can detect that. But if you have hidden terminals, hidden terminals aren't like that. In hidden terminals, you have asymmetry in sensing. So here, here's a an example, a, 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 a totally artificial example. So say transmitter A is transmitting to B, C is transmitting to D, E to F, G to H. So transmissions uh, from A, so A is transmitting data to B, and if at the same time G is transmitting to H, the transmissions from A will wipe out, they will interfere with the transmissions from G to H, so H won't be able to receive any transmissions from here, there's a conflict. But A will be able to get to B fine. Except if C is transmitting, he collides with B and so on. And the thing is that um, A, if this, this guy here was happy, say C wasn't transmitting, A is happy. His, his, uh, his transmissions are getting through just fine, and G is very unhappy. So they both share a clause because they're interfering with each other, but only one of them knows that there's a problem and the other one doesn't. And so that's a very common problem in, with hidden terminals. And so that violates the, the assumption earlier that every, all, all variables participating in a clause know, know whether it was satisfied or not. So this would break that. And it turns out that at least in the case of graph colouring, which is the simpler case, uh, then... So let me just explain. That you have the, so this setup here would correspond to this graph. Each of those edges is now a vertex in that graph. There's an edge between them with the interfere. We now have a directed graph because this guy affects... Uh, a affects the link GH, but not vice versa, and so on. So this, this uh, captures, this is the original problem at the top we want to solve. Here, the, the arrows don't refer to the constraints, they refer to the sensing. And all we need is for this to be connected, for the, all that previous analysis to carry over. And connecting this even actually seems even, so that's sort of interesting, but the, so you even need less sensing than I said at the start. And connectedness seems like a strong property, but actually you can get away with even less. Or you, you can have, uh, these are examples of uh, graphs that will all be, that are actually drawn from um, uh, measurements, of GPS measurements of Wi-Fi locations. Um, they, uh, these are all colourable as well, and they're not connected. So if you look at the one at the top, you can see there's a three, uh, top right there, there's three uh, connect in a clique, and then there's these external ones uh, impinging on it. And that's colourable, even though it's not connected. So, so weakly connected uh, clumps are also colourable. And, and everything will work. So actually, on a very uh, when you do tests on typical topologies, it seems like it's going to work. Uh, those, these algorithms work with high probability, even in, in quite uh, even in realistic situations where we have asymmetric sensing. So that was, quite, that was, a, that was a really nice result, because it was a big concern that that might not hold. So let me uh, shoot on quickly. So, so I'll, I'll show two sorts of results quickly to back up my claim that it's fast. And, and we originally were really excited about this because we thought, so, so I'll tell you, uh, let me explain what this is. So one of the standard constraint satisfaction problems is KSAT. So that's where we have binary, binary valued variables, take 0, 1. The K is the number of variables participating in a clause. 
and each clause is formed by anding and ordering or knotting. So they're all logical. And uh, so we can draw uniformly at random from the set of clauses. And uh, that's a standard, uh, t there's been a, t a ton of analysis of those kind of problems by, uh, um, in, in, in a mixture of the computer science community and the physics guys. And it's known, the important things are the ratio are of uh, clauses to the number of variables. As this n number increases, the problem's getting harder and harder. The number of clauses is approaching the number of variables. And you get a transition point when, uh, with probability one, uh, none of the, uh, if you, you're drawing at random from the set of possible problems, with probability one, none of them are solvable. You get a transition point. And so this one here is for uh, three sat, so vari three variables. And the transition happens just about here at four. That's where people think that threshold is. This would, walk sat here would be one of the, the sort of, uh, as generally judged to be quite high performance for these problems. And you know, this is a log scale here. So it's linear and log scale, so it's increasing exponentially with R. And then when we approach the boundary, it's going faster than exponentially. So as you approach that boundary, it's becoming incredibly slow. And you can see the numbers that are getting really high. Uh, this blue is for the CFL, the very first algorithm I showed. And it's increasing linearly, and it doesn't have the super exponent. It's about, so it's almost the same performance as, as the, the walks at. It doesn't have the super linear uh, behavior, super exponential behavior as you approach the boundary. And yet it has no communication. So, it's got, so we've, we've got a much simpler algorithm, much less information, and we're getting almost the same performance down here as for a more complicated algorithm that's state of the art. And actually we're doing better near the boundary. So that was kind of interesting. And that's not just, that's for 3 sat, and here's the results for um, 5 sat, and 4 sat, and 5 sat. So in, as you increase the number of variables, it gets harder and harder and harder. So you can see this number here is increasing. And it's consistent. And so um, the qu that kind of raises the question of, that was raising the question, what, 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 why, what is communication buying you? If you could communicate, what performance gain would, would you be able to get? Because what walks at, which is using communication, isn't getting better performance than an algorithm which has no communication. So what value does communication add? And there's a question mark around that. And so at least part, a part answer to that is those, those examples, those nasty examples like the star or the consensus problems there. It seems that if you have communication, you can do much fast, much better on those kind of graphs uh, than, than without. But uh, in general, it's a hard, it's an interesting question. I don't have answers. I still have questions around it. Um, how am I doing for time? Um, let me show you an example that's kind of um, getting closer to wireless networks. So this is a, a Fifth Avenue in New York. And so there's measurements of the access point locations there. And it's three dimensional, these are tower blocks. And so there's, I think there's 81 access points within a tiny area actually, it's 200 meters squared. Uh, so it's very dense. The distance, this is the distribution of distances between access points. Uh, these are measured by, from GPS data, people walking around and so on. So it's not perfect data by any means, but at least it's partially realistic. It's not, it's not uh, uh, I didn't generate it, someone else generated it. Uh, so the number of neighbours, so we can see the, within uh, 30 metres we have 10 neighbours. Remember we only have three channels. So it's a, it's a very dense, it's a tough problem with a, a semi-realistic topology. We don't have, we don't have uh, you know, the radio propagation in that area, so we come up with a propose a rough model that's, that's again a caricature of, of, a, of what we think it would really be like, but at least it's got some features. So we let, look at the distance between access points, if they're, um, if they're nearby, to, if they're within uh, five meters of each other, then we want them to be at least three channels apart. They've chosen, cha so this, we've got uh, 11 channels, we want them to choose at least three channels apart, which is orthogonal channels, if they're within five meters. If they're within 10 meters, then two channels apart, because we've got some physical attenuation, would be good enough. And if they're uh, up to 30, then we want them to be um, more than uh, at least one channel apart. After that, we can have overlap. And so you can find solutions. So you, so you run it. Here, here's how it looks like. The, the, this is one, an example coloring in three dimensions. It's hard to see. I should have, you should overlay the buildings, the tower blocks, and so on on here. but. It's, even that would just make it even more uh, complicated to see. Here's the, here's the distribution of convergence times. It's a stochastic algorithm, so every time you run it, it takes a different time to converge. Uh, so this is the distribution of run times uh, versus the frequency. So 
the median time is, so the 0.5 value is about 50 or less. It's about 30, I think, for this case. So this is 81 access points. Remember, it was incredibly really dense, quite a complicated topology. It's not graph colouring here because of those clauses. They're, they're not graph colouring clauses. They're, they're uh, T-colouring. They're, 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 they're um, more complicated than normal graph colouring. And we're converging in 30 iterations. And if you take, uh, if, for example, they were all switched off, and then you, so power cut, and then you switch them on again, if it was like 10 seconds per iteration, which is a kind of reasonable number for sensing the channel, and 30 iterations, that's 300 seconds. So within five minutes, you're, they've reorganized with the median 50% of the time. Four minutes, I'm seeing there. OK, and some experimental measurements. Maybe I should wrap up in a minute. So these are within the Hamilton. Here there were crude, one, crude uh, measurements using, so there's much more sophisticated ways of measuring the channel quality, what, of detecting whether interference is happening or not between neighboring wireless lands. Here we did a very simple thing just to get stuff, some results. It's quite old data. Uh, we used RTS CTS. So we said um, if we send an RTS and we don't get the CTS, then we call that a collision. That's a legitimate loss. If we get RTS CTS in the data but we don't get an ACK, that was an error. Uh, and if we get RTS CTS a data hack, that was success. So here we're thinking that should be that's a hidden terminal collision. That would be bad. So we we a wireless LAN jumps to a channel, sends some data, measures these statistics over ten seconds, and uh, if the error is above some threshold, it says, uh, okay, that was a bad channel. I'm going to jump. I'm unhappy. If it's below a threshold, it says I'm happy. So here is just time histories. You can't. I'm sorry, you can't see the, these legends here. So it's true, but they, there's, there were four wireless lands here, uh, five wireless lands here, and they're bouncing around between the colours, and eventually, they uh, they settle down. And you can't see the, all the colours. I'm afraid. Um, these two have settled. See, this one's the green. The green and the blue have settled on top of each other. That's why there's only four lines. Um, and the interesting thing is, this was the the p number of packets sent, the packet count for each of the wireless lands over time. And it's not zero, that, that's, that's kind of what I was trying to allude to with the showing the simulation of it converging, that while it's converging, it's still actually all right. It quite quickly gets to the point when you've got useful throughput. So even while it's learning, it's, uh, you're still getting throughput. And as this guy finds a good channel, his throughput increases, so the slope increases. As each of them learns, they do better. OK, so I'll just wrap up. So the, the, although these are all networking problems, and often I've talked a lot about graph colouring, actually it's a much bigger class of problems, these KSAT problems. Uh, so KSAT would be an example, sorry, and constraint satisfaction more generally. Uh, a big range of problems fall into that, but not optimization problems. That's the, there's a dividing line between feasibility, satisfiability, satisfi satisfaction problems and optimization. Um, for all sorts of practical reasons, we uh, are having to consider decentralized solvers. Actually, even if we can communicate, it's not clear that we would choose to because it's a cost, it's hard, it, it's com extra complexity when you come to implement it. Uh, there's, uh, it doesn't scale as well. There's lots of reasons why even if you could communicate, you might not want to, as long as you don't suffer too much of a performance hit. And uh, those results suggest that it's not a, a given that you will suffer a performance hit. Um, we've got a, actually multiple solvers, the whole class of ones that seem to work pretty well, um, both in simulations and experiments, and that you can um, very simple to implement. Where analysis, I think, is quite loose. E to the n squared seems bad. Um, and it's not at all surprising that it would be loose because the, me the, the method of proof is, is very different from what you see in practice. So the worst case analysis. Um, an obvious question is, the, in special classes, can we say something of graph? Can we say something stronger? And we can, for sure. We can say that, if, for example, if we have enough colours, bigger than the degree plus one number of colours, for example, then, then we'll converge very quickly indeed. That's, that's much more recent results based on that, that simpler algorithm, and, and so we're pushing that a bit harder to see uh, if we can get stronger results because the algorithm is simpler and so more easy to analyse. Uh, there's a, just a still an open question about the cost of, commu of no communication. So it's not clear that there's any cost. In some situations, our, our results are suggesting there is no actual cost. So what, what the, what does that mean? That means either uh, there still out there, there's an algorithm that's going to be faster, that uses communication in a more efficient way, and will beat what's out there just now. 
I, I suspect that's the case, and it's just the, the, the scope for improvement of the current algorithms if you use communication, but let's, that's a question in its own right. And it's also, but also separately from that, so there's clearly some cases where uh, communication is giving you a gain. Um, and just trying to understand that is, 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 is hard, but, but interesting. And I've been trying to uh, uh, emphasize there that it's all about feasibility here. All solutions are the same, but if you're interested in optimality, which you often are, then, uh, then that's a different, different kettle of fish. But I think a lot of this stuff uh, has potential to be extended into optimality as well, actually. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Doc. Uh, any questions to the speaker? Converge. So I've got results for um, quite a lot of results for the case of, of uh, contention-free scheduling. So that's where you have a complete graph. And say you add a new, a new station joins and starts transmitting. And there you can actually even, because it's, it's a special sort of graph, you can do some analysis. And the sorts of conversion times you see are like five iterations. Median time would be five iterations. Uh, so it's very fast to, to converge. And you can do some analysis to back that up. That's not just simulations. In general graphs, um, they, they, you can kind of get some sense. We've got um, results that tend to show, these are not analytic results, but simulation results showing that if you add a new vertex, uh, typically you'll get some local, it's parsimonious, you get some local recolouring, uh, but it doesn't spread unless it has to. So it's quite, it's quite efficient, actually, when you um, are adding and deleting vertices over time. There's a, a got simulation results for that and a little bit of analysis for the complete graph case. Yeah, um, what's up? A partial answer, yeah. And the, the, the obvious question, by the way, is what happens if you don't have enough colours? What if the problem is not feasible? In which case, uh, I think the algorithm does sensible things. You could maybe sort of sense that from the simulations. Mostly everyone's happy. A few, few bits of unhappiness moves around. But analysing that, analysing the stationary, so, it's a, so there's going to be a probability distribution of happiness and unhappiness over that graph, and analysing that is, is an open question. I don't know how to do that. Okay. Okay, in case there are no other questions, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that Professor Lit is going to stay here uh, at Halmstad University until tomorrow. So you have a chance to talk to him tomorrow morning and afternoon. Uh, then I really hope that we will keep a kind contact and permanent contact with Hamilton Institute in the future. Uh, I know, Doug, that you have been uh, quite busy with traveling this week, so thanks a lot for finding the slot to visit us uh, these days. And uh, on behalf of myself personally, and on behalf of the overall Halmstad University, uh, there is a small gift for you, uh, for your time and for your contribution to help us to solve our problems, uh, research problems, I mean. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, I hope you enjoy those few days uh, here in Sweden. Thanks.